Good morning, everyone. It's um, pretty early in the morning, actually, here. Uh, stormy day here in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, April 14th, we're getting towards the end of the course, which means we're getting towards the end of the the time scale, which means that we are into the Cenozoic. And of course, Cenozoic goes from um, 66 million years to the present day. We'll go through this. I, I have one more lecture for you um, after this, kind of pull everything together um, at the end, but this will be the last you know, material lecture. A number of you have asked me about the, the third exam and needing a little bit more time to finish that. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, the deadline for question the the two questions I, I put up one of the questions uh, for the for the third exam. I'll put the other one up either today or tomorrow so that you have that. And as far as I'm concerned, the deadline for those can be um, can be up until um, the last day of exams. So you have any time between now. And the last day of exams to get those to me, and then uh, and I'll go ahead and grade them. Also, I want to let you know once again that if you are having lab issues, um, deadline issues with labs, uh, problems with internet, all of that, I know it's a weird time. So if you have any of those problems with the lab, contact Scott directly. Don't you don't need to go through me. I've talked to Scott. He understands the situation. He's willing to work with you, um, but please contact him directly. His email's on on the website. So let's uh, talk about this, the uh, Cenozoic. And of course, the the time scale for the Cenozoic, it, it's, it, there's a lot of controversy about it. It had an old um, division that was, um, you know, divided up into the Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, Plio, Pleisto, and Holocene, which are today. Most uh, now refer to um, the just the Paleogene and Neogene. So what used to be the uh, the KT boundary, it used to be the Tertiary and the Quaternary. Tertiary is now Paleogene and Neogene is now divided up the the tertiary is divided up into the Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, and Pliocene, and then the Quaternary is the Pleistocene to present. It's not, it's not a big deal um, how these are divided up. It continues to be in the state of flux. There is a proposal to have a newest geological period, period called. But basically, it covers the last 66 million years of Earth history. We'll talk about several things in this lecture. Um, be or these it may take two lectures. Beginning with the major tectonic events across the globe, and this includes the rise of the Himalayas and the closure of the Tethyan Ocean, um, resulting in climate change. There was an equatorial ocean. The Tethyan Ocean was basically an equatorial ocean. So if you imagine um, the Earth and right around the equator, Instead of having things like the Isthmus of Panama, instead of having the, the closure of the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean sealed off from the rest, there was kind of a global equatorial ocean. So that meant that oceanic circulation was a little bit different, especially in the early part of the Cenozoic. And when, the, when this Tethyan Ocean, which is the name of this equatorial ocean, when that closed, that caused tremendous amount of climate change. There was in Western North America, where if you continue in this major, the BS major, you will do your field camp. There was rifting that took place in Western North America in two phases. One, the Rio Grande Rift, and the second called the Basin and Range. Rifting just means that North America was trying, there was an attempt to break North America apart along the Rio Grande Rift and Basin and Range. It didn't succeed, of course, um, but it did cause extension, some unique geological features out there. In the Southern Ocean, the important event was the opening of the Drake Passage between South America and Antarctica, and again, another pulse of global ch climate change. What happened there when the Drake Passage opened, it isolated Antarctica, and there became a circum-Antarctica current which led to the glaciation of Antarctica. We also had the rise of the Alps in Europe, um, the closure of the Isthmus of Panama, and then, of course, rifting 
in East Africa, which is thought to be the, the birthplace of, of humans. So let's talk about some of these in turn. Um, the first being the rise of the Himalayas. You can see um, here the great uh, Himalayan mountain change and the motion of India, the rather rapid motion of India actually, uh, beginning here at about 71 million years ago and finally um, closing uh, up and smashing up against Asia around 10 million years ago. This is um, at least one of the fastest documented plate velocities in the Phanerozoic. So India moved at about 20 centimeters per year. That's about five times the normal speeds of plates today. So, and, and India is made up of really old Archean crust. So essentially you can view India as a battering ram into the Asian continent. And because it was two continents colliding, um, you got this incredible uh, Himalayan mountain chain. I know that um, some people call it Himalayas and some people call it Himalayas. So you say tomato, I say tomato. Actually, I say tomato, you might say tomato. But this, the Himalaya is a Sanskrit word and there is no doubt about the correct Sanskrit, Sanskrit pronunciation. Um, so the English equivalents are him, ma as in father, la, and ya. So Himalaya. Um, However, Himalaya is also correct. It's just a little semantics, but if you want to know, if you want to sound smart, you can say it's actually Himalaya. Um, so looking at the India-Asia collision in particular, it began, of course, with the breakup of Gondwana. India was part of Gondwana. And this is kind of a cladogram. So you view this as kind of, you know, how these different continents broke apart. And beginning at about 180 million years ago, that is when Gondwana began to break apart. And there were basically two halves of Gondwana. This is the West Gondwana half here. Um, and Africa began to separate from South America at 160 million years ago. And over in Eastern Gondwana, the breakup began about 130 million years ago with Madagascar, India, Seychelles as well um, included in this. Uh, they were together until about 90 million years ago when they began to split. And then Australia and Antarctica were together um, from 130 to about 100 million years ago uh, when when they began to split. So that's that's a cladogram or the the diagram of how Gondwana broke up. Um, the rifting between India and Madagascar began around 90 million years ago with uh, the Marian hotspot volcanism. So if you may be familiar from from GOI. 2010 that the hotspot in Hawaii is a hotspot. There's a similar hotspot. There's a number of these around the globe. And the volcanism that began to break apart India and Madagascar started about 90, 90 million years ago with the Marian hotspot. And then India accelerated towards Asia around 65, 66 million years with the eruption of the Deccan Traps. And we talked about the importance of the Deccan Traps to perhaps the KP extinction. But this eruption of these Deccan traps gave India a big push, um, big push towards Asia, and India moved at uh, velocities of up to 20 centimeters per year during its journey northward to Asia. Uh, this is a, another schematic of this, um, uh, what was going on here. Uh, beginning in the Triassic, we had pieces that were colliding ahead of India into Asia, including uh, Kianting and the Lhasa block in the early Cretaceous colliding with Eurasia, and then India kind of storming in to Asia as this battering ram uh, beginning. There's a lot of debate exactly as to how, when this collision began, because there were a number of pieces that collided ahead of India. So there, there is some debate, but certainly during the Cenozoic, at least beginning around 50 million years ago, Asia was beginning to feel this battering ram. And it's been modeled as this you know, rigid block. So this is a, a schematic model with Asia more deformable. And so you had India colliding with Asia. And because Asia, the, 
consider Asia kind of toothpaste and India your 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 hand squeezing the toothpaste, right? When you squeeze that toothpaste, when you squeeze Asia, it begins to squeeze out and a lot of Asia was squeezed out towards the east along a series of faults and suture zones. So India pushing it, this battering ram of India pushing into Asia created this very unique uh, mountain range, the Himalayas, but it also created these tremendously long strike slip faults along which much of this uh, more uh, deformable East Asian crust kind of squirted out towards the east. Um, the archetypal, this is kind of what in the India-Asia collision looks like now in terms of uh, how things sit. You can see Tarim Basin here, a basin that opened up between um, India and Eurasia, and you can see all of this material being squeezed out to the east um, as this battering ram of India collided with Asia. The uplift, so as the Himalayas were uplifted, of course, it caused an increase in weathering and sediment influx into the ocean. So you can look here at sort of the sedimentation rate that has been documented throughout the Cenozoic, actually goes a little bit back into the Cretaceous. These sedimentation rates in the Indian Ocean were very low. And then beginning at about 40 million years ago, you start seeing this steep step upwards. And so at least we know the collision, and it may not have been India entirely, but collisions ahead of India began building this Himalayan mountain chain and it kind of, you know, pulsed forward beginning here around 35, 32 million years ago and it pulsed upward um, to deliver this great amount of, of sedimentary influx into the ocean. The mountains themselves, of course, as they built up, they restricted moist airflow into Asia and they caused desert formation on the leeward side and intensification of the monsoon on the windward side. What does that mean? It got dry north of the India uh, collisional zone, north of the Himalayas. It became very, very dry. India itself is subjected, India and much of Asia um, is subjected to annual monsoons, just like we have a hurricane season, they have a monsoon season. And there was also global cooling that took place with the rise of the Himalayas due to increased CO2 consumption. If you recall, a long time ago when we talked about the snowball earth, I said that one of the things that happens um, in order to draw down CO2 from the atmosphere is that you can increase weathering rates. And if you increase weathering rates, it has the effect of pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. The CO2 is locked up in clay particles. And so it's thought that this rise of the Himalayas and this increased weathering and influx of sediment into the ocean, creation of clays and so forth on land, led to uh, global cooling as well. Um, we'll move over to the U.S. now and look at several physiographic provinces in the western U.S. and talk a little bit about how these formed in the Cenozoic. Again, if you end up going to field camp, you'll you'll hear about this in much more detail. But this is a false color image, Landsat imagery of the western U.S. And just to give you some idea, California is along here. Um, this is the Colorado Plateau. Um, the Rio Grande Rift, one of those rift provinces that I talked about earlier, extends along the eastern side of the Colorado Plateau down into Mexico, New Mexico and into Mexico and a little bit of Texas as well. So this, a rift just means that the North America tried to break apart there. Over to the west of the Colorado Plateau is this big, broad region called the Basin and Range. And this is found, you find the Basin and Range province um, in Utah and Nevada and places for, uh, in, in that region, you can see it's a pretty broad area of extension. Again, this is a rift extensional region in the western U.S. Both the uh, Rio Grande Rift and the Basin and Range Province are Cenozoic rift events that are changing western North America. And what happens during rifting is that the crust extends. And in the Basin and Range, the crust is extended hundreds of, uh, of kilometers. So it used to be much narrower. 
And as it began rifting, it began spreading apart and creating new space. And so the basin and range is accommodating new space in Western North America as North America attempts to break apart. And of course, associated with basin and range in Colorado, or, or not Colorado Plateau, but the Rio Grande Rift would be an increase in volcanism as well. Um, prior to both of those um, rifting events and, and somewhat coincident overlapping with them, uh, there were two big orogenies in the western U.S. And the first one is called the severe orogeny. It began likely about 140 million years ago due to compressional forces. Um, and there were two plates that are now, that were part once part of the Pacific plate. They're called the Kula plate and the Farallon plate. They're gone now. Uh, most of them are gone now anyways. And they bordered the interior seaway to the west and the load itself, so if you if you're building up mountains out there, it created a, a number of basins. It created something called thin skin thrusting. That's just a type of fault, and it means that the fault didn't lift the basement material up. And and the latter stages overlapped with this Laramide orogeny. The Laramide orogeny was late Cretaceous to tertiary. Um, it affected all the same regions out west as the severe orogeny, but extended a little bit further east. It was thick-skinned, what that means, it's, it's really not that critical, but it means instead of just kind of peeling off the upper sedimentary layers of rock, it also, it also uplifted these basement um, metamorphic and igneous rocks that were much, buried much deeper. So it exposed much more of the Earth's crust as it uplifted. And this was thought to be due to rapid convergence of the Farallon plate and out west, as you go to field camp, you'll see something called an asamiento uplift um, that formed during this Laramide orogeny. The Rio Grande Rift itself is a series of asymmetric grobbins, and I'll show you what a Horsten grobbin is, but um, these are two German words. Grobbin means grave, Horst, H-O-R-S-T, means uplifted. So you have these uplifted blocks, and then you have these downlifted blocks. And it began about 30 million years ago as the crust began to extend. And there was associated volcanism with this. There was low angle normal faulting. Normal faulting is associated with rifting. Formation of these horse and graben structures and, and volcanism. And then the, the second pulse, much more recent, happened between about nine to three, maybe even two and a half million years ago included much more voluminous volcanism, large-scale faulting, and stretching of the crust in the Rio Grande Rift area. And then it kind of stopped. Um, it, it, there's still active faulting out there. There's still relatively young volcanism associated with this. It's not so intense. And if we look at the rift basins uh, of New Mexico to the north in Colorado and New Mexico, is the San Luis Basin. It has formed within the past four and a half million years ago. Our field camp uh, location is right here in Taos. We're in the kind of in the transition between the San Luis Basin in the north, the Española Basin here in the middle, and the Española formed between five and three million years ago. And then the Albuquerque Belen Basin is coeval. These were forming about the same time. And then further to the south is uh, are the the Socorro base and the the basins further to the south. All of these are still actively subsiding. What does that mean? That means they're still dropping down. Sub subsidence means that the basins are getting deeper. Basins are these low spots, even though they sit at high elevation. They're relatively low spots um, compared to the surrounding terrain. So the Rio Grande Rift. Um, of course, follows the Rio Grande River. You can see here's the Rio Grande. Here it goes into the San Luis Basin and then flows south through Santa Fe and Albuquerque, Socorro, down into Las Cruces and El Paso. So it follows the Rio Grande River. Or the Rio Grande River actually follows this because it created low spots. And they're still actively subsiding. Beautiful area. Um, again, when you go to field camp, we'll be mainly concentrated here in, in Taos, New Mexico. To the east of the Española Basin, so here's the Española Basin here, here's the Albuquerque-Belen Basin that I showed you, 
there's this really strange um, volcanic edifice called the Jemez Volcanic Field. It happens to be situated in near Los Alamos, New Mexico. And if you know anything about history, Los Alamos is this national laboratory, one of the national laboratories that was involved in building the first atomic bomb. So when you go here and you tour through the Jemez Mountains, you'll see these uh, research area 49, research area 32, um, area 51, of course, is in Nevada. But it's kind of cool to see these. And they're all fenced off and mined. It's a really highly secure area. It is a national lab where they do a lot of defense contract work and so forth. But most importantly is within this Jemez volcanic field is a relatively recent um, volcanism and a relatively recent violent volcanism that formed two calderas called the Valles caldera and the Toledo caldera. Volcanism within the Jemez started about 13 million years ago. The Toledo caldera formed about 1.4 million years ago and the Valles caldera formed about 1.1 million years ago. That's not all that long ago. The area is still incredibly active in terms of hot springs. You can find hot springs throughout the Jemez. And what's weird is that this volcanism overlaps um, with the Rio Grande Rift volcanism. Uh, you know, they're, they're roughly the same age, but they're completely different in terms of their chemistry and in terms of their eruptive history. So it appears that although this volcanic activity was occurring at the same time as the Rio Grande Rift, the driving the driving mechanism for this volcanism is very, very different. Um, for those of you who don't know, wondering what a caldera is, caldera is simply when you have a, a large magma chamber and all of that magma chamber empties out in one, one big eruption then typically what happens is that magma chamber is now empty. It's almost like it's, it is the same as a sinkhole in essence, and that you create this void and then the volcanic complex that sits on top of that, that big volcano that was up there and sits on top of that actually collapses down into itself, into the magma chamber and forms this big hole in the ground. So a caldera is analogous to a volcanic sinkhole. Um, the basin and range, over to the west of the Colorado Plateau, here's the Colorado Plateau, the Rio Grande Rift going up through here, and here's the Great Basin, the Basin and Range. And this is a series of horse. Horse are these uplifted blocks. You can see them here. Um, this is taken from an airplane out west. You can see there are these uplifted blocks. And in between them are grobbins, these down dropped blocks in between them. These are bounded on either side by a normal fault. Normal faulting happens during extension. Um, Horst is a German word. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly what it means, but it's uplifted. Graben means grave, and graves, of course, are the, the downthrown blocks within the basin and range. If you um, look at this, here's a sketch of what a Horst and Graben is. These are normal faults on either side. You see these uplifted blocks here are horse, the down drop blocks on either side of them are grobbins. And this province started about 20 million years ago um, as the earth crust stretched, thinned, and then broke into some 400 mountain blocks that partly rotated from their original horizontal positions. And these mountains are um, contain late Precambrian to Paleozoic rock, and they continue to erode and fill in the intervening uh, valleys with fresh sediment. So basin and range in the western U.S. is still active. Again, you would go there, you find volcanism associated with basin and range extension. You find faulting associated with basin and range extension um, still actively going on. The, the crust is continuing to stretch. And I think in places it may be over a thousand kilometers that it is stretched. All right, turning to the south, um, down near South America, um, before about 40 million years ago, the Antarctic continent was largely ice-free and covered with pine forests and a reasonably diverse ecosystem. And I think I mentioned this, um, that Antarctica, even though, even if you go back into the Cretaceous, even though it was situated near the South Pole and dark for six to nine months of the year, it did have this relatively rich and diverse ecosystem. 
And then after about 40 million years ago, Antarctica began to cool and eventually became the ice-covered continent that we have now. Of course, it's melting again due to global global climate change, but it, it's largely still ice-covered. And there was speculation that the opening of a seaway between the Pacific and the Atlantic isolated Antarctica and created this circumpolar Antarctic current. So what does that mean? Well, it means that warm waters were no longer available to Antarctica and it began to cool. Instead of having warmer waters coming down from the equator, from the equatorial Pacific and warmer waters coming down from the equatorial Atlantic, those are sealed off. And so all you had around Antarctica was this circum-Antarctic current. So it just kept circling it. And of course, because it's situated near the South Pole, it doesn't get to warm up and, it, and Antarctica got colder and colder and eventually entirely glaciated. Um, where, what does that look like? Here is the Drake Passage here. Um, there is opening of the, so there is rifting that happened between South America and Antarctica. And as that rifting um, opened up this passage, these two were no longer connected. And then there was no communication. So the South, the Pacific, currents would come down along here, the Atlantic currents would come down along here, and they would warm Antarctica. And once that Drake Passage opened, of course, the currents were no longer, um, no longer had to move down to Antarctica. They weren't blocked by land. They were able to move through here. And that isolated Antarctica and caused it to cool and to ice over. So here's kind of what the currents look like now. Here's the South Equatorial um, current and the South Pacific um, currents here, you know, they created this gyre that, that at one time would warm the Antarctic continent. And the same with the, the equatorial Atlantic current would come down here and also warm Antarctica. But once that Drake Passage opened, what happened is that you had this Antarctic subpolar current simply circling Antarctica and keeping it cool and ended up um, glaciating Antarctica. The last uh, tectonic event that I want to talk about is the alpine orogeny. And actually, the alpine orogeny is, covers the same time interval as the Himalayan orogeny, except it was caused by a separate collision between Africa and Europe. But it's roughly the same age. And you can see this alpine uh, Himalayan belt extends all the way through southern Europe across uh, the Middle East and then over and connects to the Himalayan or orogeny as well. So it's a big mountain belt. It began in the Cretaceous and then later the younger parts of it overlaps with the Himalayan orogeny and many people consider these to be a continuation of the other. Even though the mechanisms and the collision um, you know, what was colliding were very different. They are, they do overlap in time. So if you look at this alpine, uh, it's a very long linear belt of mountains that dominate much of southern Europe, and it resulted from the collision of Africa with Europe. Okay, um, let's turn to uh, a more uh, fun topic here, um, which is the the evolution and the progression of humankind. And I'll apologize right away to my anthropology students um, if some of this is a little bit outdated. But I just want to go over this because, of course, we that's who we are. And so it's always interesting to figure out about our origins. Um, one of the oldest um, primates, um, this particular thumb-sized primate that was found in Madagascar several years ago. There were early primates um, that began to evolve to fit new environmental niches. You know, at the end of the Cretaceous, all of those lizards and dinosaurs that dominated the landscape had died out, and it created this unique um, laboratory for the organisms that survived that KP extinction to take over the landscape and to dominate the landscape. And the organisms that did that, that were most successful at taking over that landscape, of course, were the mammals. They weren't the only, the only organisms, but by and large, um, they populated much of the land that was laid barren by the KP extinction. 
And about 40 million years ago, the early primates uh, began to evolve and to occupy these new niches. If we look at, um, if we if we actually zoom in now a little bit to look at some of the first hominids um, and and the first primates, we kind of go back um, to about. Uh, go back here. The first prosimians, of course, uh, began to evolve right after the KP extinction during the Paleocene. The first um, monkeys about 35 million years or so ago, the first apes around 23 million years ago, and then the first hominids, our immediate ancestors, about 5 million years ago. In terms of our connections, our family tree here, you can see um, you can go back to about four and a half, five million years ago to um, to Australo, Ramidus, and, and some of the early hominids back then, and then Afarensis, and then you can see the connections move on to um, modern humans, included in here, of course, our Neanderthals, Homo erectus, the ones that we've all heard about. But this is a, this is our immediate family tree that began somewhere of around uh, five million years ago. If we look at some of these early ancestors, Australopithecus afarensis, about three and a half million years ago, the first primates to exhibit bipedalism appeared on Earth. There's been a lot of debate about the advantages of bipedalism and why bipedalism arose. Why did we begin to stand up um, instead of use all four legs? Um, because our backs and knees are actually, uh, I'll say engineered, I use that loosely, but our backs and knees are much engi are engineered to be work better as knuckle walkers. We, we're not, our bodies are not designed, we're not designed to be upright, but there there are advantages to that, right? Um, and one particular reason is that there was climate, climate change that occurred during that time. And so rather than living in trees and living in forests, we had to go out and forage um, in the lowlands to find food. And of course, that led to dangers such as being eaten by other mammals who were very hungry and more aggressive. And so this ability to, to, to stand and to look around and to evaluate danger, as well as to forage in the lowlands, began a selective pressure um, for bipedalism. I realize I'm skipping over a whole bunch of arguments about bipedalism. But this climate change and this drying out of the, the, the Sahara um, was big. And so if we look at kind of the early traits for primates, um, common physical traits were dense hair or some fur covering, uh, warm-blooded, of course, uh, giving birth to live young, that live young were dependent upon the parents um, for a much longer of time. And, of course, that allowed for um, a more brain development, and maybe it was the fact that the brains began to develop more. The infants depended on their parents um, far longer than many mammals. Early primates also appear to be social organisms, so they had a social life. They play, they observe, they imitate, they create some sort of uh, hierarchy, some pecking order as to where you stand in that society. So all of these were developing, um, you know, in these early primates. And eventually this social life, of course, leads to cooperation, leads to um, better defense against attackers, helps um, food, helps raise young if one of the parents um, were not around and so forth. So there's a lot of advantages to, to some of these traits that develop. Uh, if we look at the primate family tree, here, this is a little bit simpler one. Um, you can see that there were these prosimians, the so-called New World monkeys, Old World monkeys, and then the hominids that include the gibbon, the orangutan, human gorilla, and chimpanzee. So all of these are our relatives. Um, you know, this there's this cartoon image out there that you know a monkey gave birth to a human. That's not how it happened. We are cousins. 
Um, we evolved about the same time and we just went in different directions due to the environment and the advantages that were required in that environment. In terms of the evolution of bipedalism, um, recognize this here as a human, um, there were anatomical changes to the neck, to the chest, to the lower back, to the hips and pelvis, the thighs, the knees, um, and the feet all required some change, some not really necessarily fundamental change because things like our knees and our backs are still better suited to, uh, are not well suited to bipedalism. But there's a number of ideas as to why bipedalism began and these anatomical changes kind of worked their way through the population. These include, you know, the ability to use tools, right? Because if you're standing upright, you suddenly have two two more limbs that can do things. Um, you don't have to worry about them for walking. You can, you can grab things. You can defend yourself. Uh, you can do a lot of things. Um, there's arguments that it was more energy efficient um, to be piedlidal. There's uh, how you control your body temperature, the uh, variability in habitat, the advantages to reproduction, um, and you know things that happen the canine reduction. So there's a whole bunch of these, and I encourage you if you're interested, um, take an anthropology class. They can do a much better job at explaining all of this and all the controversies about this. For whatever reason. Um, you want to choose, and it probably wasn't a single reason, it was probably many reasons, bipedalism began to be favored in the, in the hominid species. If we look at pre-hominid evolution, uh, we kind of look at this timeline here, beginning 4.4 4 to 5 million years ago, um, leading up to a whole bunch of different species here, different um, uh, organisms here, down to about a million years ago. And through this, through this development, of course, bipedalism arose, tools began to be used by these organisms, and of course, some sort of rudimentary language. In terms of hominids, um, you probably recognize some of these, Homo habilis, uh, which was a tool user, uh, Homo erectus, uh, Heidelbergensis, Neanderthals, and of course, Homo sapiens, uh, thinking man, thinking thinking person. So these are the these are the hominids here, and their development beginning around, um, you know, sometime around two, maybe a little bit earlier, two million years ago. Um, the major um, advances in within that Homo group were brain size, the bigger brain size, uh, more efficient bipedalism, um, hunting the ability to create fire, um, the use of tools, of course, the ability to build shelters, um, clothing, and language all seem to develop within this, this hominid, hominid evolutionary changes. We look at, um, beginning with Homo habilis, these were the probably the first um, tool users. Their brain size, the average cranial size, is about 612 um, cubic centimeters. They were around from about 2.3 to 1.6. They were, of course, the first tool makers. Um, they had a, you know, kind of this more ape-like face with a big brow ridge. They probably ate meat, not exclusively, but they were probably meat eaters. They may have had some arboreal existence, uh, either living within the trees or in the trees. Um, and they were discovered in 1960 by the Leakeys, the famous um, hominid and uh, hominid scientists that lived in East Africa. Uh, there is uh, no clear indication that they had developed speech, but they must have been able to communicate um, with one another through some means. But whether or not it was a complex uh, speech pattern that we see in later hominids or not, it's not clear. Um, there are some finds in East Africa that indicate that Homo habilis was not very different from the Australopithecines in terms of their body size and shape. And the earliest Homo erectus remains um, indicate rapid biological change somewhere in this interval between Homo habilis and Homo erectus. 
the fossil record for this transition of Homo habilis to Homo erectus um, supports an idea of punctuated equilibrium model of evolution. What does that mean? That was kind of Stephen Gould's idea that you know evolution uh, occurred you know overall relatively slowly, so that you know you didn't jump from one type of organism to a vastly different type of organism within that family quickly. But occasionally there would be pressures, whether they were environmental pressures or something else that would cause those organisms to undergo a, a much more rapid change. And it appears uh, that the fossil record uh, that led to Homo erectus occurred very, very quickly. Um, Homo erectus was considerably taller and had a much uh, larger brain overall than Homo habilis. Uh, Homo erectus was discovered by Eugene Dubois in Java in 1891. Uh, he called it uh, Pithecanthropus erectus, um, was also dubbed as Java man. Uh, finds in China called uh, Sinanthropus dates from 1.9 to 27,000 years before present. The brain size was about 994 um, cubic centimeters, compare that to um, 612. That's a big increase in brain size. And the thought is, of course, that the increase in brain size also is reflects an increase in intelligence. And the increase in intelligence, uh, of course, allows for more tool use and, and more developed tools than we're seeing in Homo habilis. Homo erectus was very successful in terms of the fossil record and in terms of distribution of Homo erectus throughout throughout much of Asia um, it means that it, it that family of organisms persisted for quite a lot of time. Um, why was it so successful? Lots of ideas. There was less sexual dimorphism. There were maybe pair bonds and marriage in some rudimentary form, and only in that uh, male and female pairs would be bonded for uh, for a much longer period of time. Um, maybe there was less hair on body, the wearing of furs, um, so, you know, clothing, um, the ability with developing clothing to move further north to to live in colder climates. And so the idea is that Homo erectus had some quick adapt to the environment without necessitating physical changes. That's important because remember evolution, especially in terms of the pressure of climate change, evolution requires physical change, but because Homo erectus was able to, to build and to create clothing and so forth, they could adapt to new environments without any pressure to, to have physical changes. And the other idea is that culture is also one of the main reasons that Homo erectus, so some sort of organization, so it wasn't just one person going out hunting, it was hunting in groups. It led to the ability to protect others against predators and maybe perhaps the control of fire um, and campsites and of course uh, continued use of tools. So Homo erectus, uh, if you look amongst, the, uh, amongst our immediate ancestors, incredibly successful um, ancestor. Homo neanderthalus or neanderthals were discovered in the Neander Valley, um, tall near Dusseldorf in Germany in 1856, had a massive brain, uh, 1,400 uh, cc's, so again, a you know, big increase compared to Homo erectus. Large tor torso, short limbs, broad nasal passages. Um, later remains show a decrease in robustness of the front teeth and face, suggesting the use of tools um, replace teeth. Uh, they retain this uh, occipital torus and some mid-facial, you know, they, they still had that ape-like look. And it is pretty clear, I think, now, um, and if you're in anthropology, you can you can tell me I'm wrong, but I believe it's pretty clear that, that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens coexisted. There was not that Homo Neanderthals went extinct and then uh, Homo sapiens took over. It appears that they, they coexisted and perhaps that Homo sapiens were more successful in competing with Neanderthals um, for this, uh, for space. Neanderthals had culture. Uh, 
uh, home sites in caves and also in the open near rivers. Um, they may have been framed with wood and covered with skins. Um, there's some indication that there was purposeful burial and ritual um, so that there was recognition of, of, of death and that perhaps some sort of early religious ceremonies or you know some sort of ritual ceremonies, whether or not it was religious or not, um, unclear. Um, language arguments back and forth, could Neanderthals talk or not? Most likely there was communication. There was some rudimentary language. And of course, also tools, much more developed tools, uh, much more advanced tool use um, within the Neanderthal culture. And the question is, what happened to the Neanderthals? Poof. Um, lots of stuff. Um, like I said, Neanderthals coexisted with Homo sapiens for at least 20,000 years, maybe as long as 60,000 years. And I don't know, there may be new data that they overlapped even younger or, or further back. A number of ideas as to what caused the death of the Neanderthals. One is that they, you know, perhaps they interbred with Homo sapiens, and and Homo sapiens were just um, more in number, and and therefore there more Homo sapiens. Uh, that Neanderthals were killed off by Homo sapiens, or that uh, Homo sapiens drove the Neanderthals into extinction through competition. There are arguments um, even that the Earth's magnetic field may have led to the the demise of the Neanderthals um, through some sort of climate change or UVB radiation. These are things that have just come out. Um, it, is a, it is not completely known as, as far as I know. The, the cause that the why Neanderthals went extinct, but they did go extinct and of course were replaced by Homo sapiens. Um, the old Homo sapiens, the archaic from about 100,000 to 35,000 years ago, sometimes called simply Homo sapiens or Homo sapiens neanderthalis, and then the more modern, uh, anatomically modern, are sometimes called Homo sapiens sapiens. Of course, cranial capacity um, increased, um, lots of you know incredible developments of you know, within these modern humans. Um, and some of the they have you know kind of subnames like Cro Magnon, thirty five thousand in in Western Europe to seventeen thousand, sixteen hundred cc cranial capacity. Uh, the name itself, Cro Magnon, came from a hotel in France. They're not a different species. They're just um, the old Homo sapiens um, from Europe, Cro Magnon. Um, in terms of their culture, they had art. There are traces of art found in beads, carvings, paintings. There are cave paintings in Spain and southern France that show a, a marked degree of skill. Um, they're mostly animals on bare walls. Um, the subjects themselves, the animals that they were chose, were favored because of their meat and skins. So the Homo sapiens used their meat, ate them, and, and used their skin. Um, human figures are rare, um, maybe due to taboos and fears that it would somehow, you know, harm others. Unclear, but humans were not the focus of much of the this early art that we see. Um, during the Upper Paleolithic, there was this hotbed of culture from about 40 to 10,000 years ago. Shelters. Um, in Ukraine, there were some made with mammoth bones. Uh, there was wood and leather working. There was carpentry. The tools, um, coring tools, blades, there were specialized tools. There were composite tools, the bow and arrow. It appears that this is the time at which uh, wolves began being domesticated and used as, uh, as pets, but at least um, helpers and some forth. There was gathering, increased gathering instead of hunting. Um, for human economics, that's important because then you can form these communities that are longer lasting, right? When you're hunting, you're out, you know, using whatever you can and going wherever you can, but it doesn't create a, uh, it doesn't create the, a more complex social structure than when you're also begin to, to uh, not just hunt, but also to gather and, and to get food that way. So much more complex social structure. And then modern ho Homo sapiens, of course, 
um, are, are what we see and that humans evolved more or less simultaneously across the entire old world from several stock ancestral populations or that there was some rapid uh, replacement model that humans have evolved only once in Africa and then migrated throughout the old world. These are debates um, that are much better suited to, to an answer, of course, but interesting um, to figure out you know, where, we, where we came from. The social organization within modern humans, we know this, of course, smaller groups, the early ones, the hunter-gatherer analogy, small groups, low population density, more nomad formed kinships, and then uh, migration was the last, North America was probably the last colonized by hominids, thought there might have been a land bridge between Russia and Alaska, so there's kind of an Asian origin of Native Americans, and it appears that about 30,000 to 12,000 years ago um, was that first migration of humans into, into uh, North America. Uh, modern humans, of course, vary in skin color, hair color, eye color, all sorts of uh, superficial uh, variations, but fundamentally within in the human population, we are all, we're all the same. Um, all right, so I think I'll stop here and we'll get into um, Florida, which is where uh, we live, and we'll talk about Florida in the next lecture.